we're uh, experimenting a little bit with microphones, and hopefully you can hear me now. Uh, we've changed microphones, and the one that we were using, apparently, you couldn't hear. So let's start again. We have a few new um, additions to our website that we've been working on. Before I get into the sort of the heart of the uh, content uh, with Facebook Live, um, then I want to tell you some updates. First of all, we've added lining to our website. We have 17 colors of Benberg Rayon, and Benberg Rayon is the best lining that you can buy. Not every style that we have in terms of patterns is a lined garment, but definitely you can line anything, turn a shirt into a jacket, you can line your pants, and some of our patterns, including the new Hollywood pants pattern, does have a bit of lining in the front, and of course the pockets and all of that. So look out uh, on our website for linings. Uh, we also are beginning to add the option of adding thread to a fabric order. It's not on every product yet. We're working at it steadily so that that will be an option that you can click on. If you need one spool, two, three, four spools, we'll choose the color and we'll decide whether it's polyester or cotton based on the fabric that you have ordered. So that will be something that will be coming and we know that you, a lot of you have been calling in and wanting thread as well during this time when it's difficult to go out and shop. But uh, just know that that's coming in the future and you'll be able to have thread in addition to your fabric. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we talked about the Hollywood pants pattern. I believe it was last week. I sort of lost track of our, uh, the topics for Facebook Live. But the, uh, we've had some questions about whether the Hollywood pants pattern will ever be a printed pattern. Uh, right now, it's a download pattern only. And it's likely to remain that way for a long time. So if you're thinking you want that style, you might as well go ahead and get it as a download. And remember that in addition to being able to print it out on a home computer, you can send that file to a copy center or some place that prints uh, blueprints, let's say for architects. They're accustomed to printing on large sheets of paper. Plus there are other uh, websites where you can send a file and have a, a pattern printed on large sheets. But for now, the Hollywood Pants pattern is a download, and I think it will remain that way <clears throat> Excuse me, for a long time. We also have uh, some new fabrics, which I'm going to show you uh, in a minute. But one new fabric that is uh, really interesting to me is this denim fabric. It's very lightweight. So if you're thinking about making any sort of casual pants, but especially the getaway jeans pattern, this is a great fabric. It's a light colored, very lightweight drapey denim. And you know, you can always tell when denim is real denim because it's always a lighter color on the wrong side. We're getting this in shortly, any day now, in white and a deeper blue as well, but for now we have the light blue. So let's talk about our newest pattern, the Venice shirt. I happen to have it on. Um, I love this shirt. I, I just feel really summery and kind of perky in this fabric and this style. Uh, and it was fun to make. It has a lot of details to it, and we're going to talk about how to uh, perform some of these details today. But it's great both as a front and back. It has this wonderful uh, ruffle on the bottom that comes up into a vent in the back. It has a cuff and a vent. It has darts from the shoulders that come down, and of course a collar and a stand, and then double buttons as well. I'm wearing it today with the Hudson pants, and I have my favorite pants on for the summer, my white viscose and linen Hudson pants. So I'm going to show you some variations and some just great Venice shirts made up in some interesting fabrics. So the first one is a Venice in a very drapey rayon fabric, and this wonderful sort of painterly, almost tie-dyed but not really uh, fabric. But you can see how drapey this is. And we have this pair of nice Hudson pants to pair with it in a cross-dyed linen. And you, you know, cross-dyed is when you have two colors of thread, the warp and the woof, or the lengthwise and the crosswise threads are two different colors, and the two mostly contrasting colors then change into one blended color. You're going to see an ad come through today on your email about the introduction of the Venice shirt 
at a special price, which is $18 for a few days. And you'll see Aaron in this one. This is a wonderful gingham check. It's a woven check, not a printed check. So you'll see her in this. I actually have paired this with a different scale of check. And these are the pencil pants. This is a download pattern. It's very slim leg, has a nice detail for the waistband. It has an elastic waist, but just a little bit. It has a one and a half inch casing, with a three quarter inch elastic sewn into it. So it's very stable. But I like the idea of the two scales of check for this combination. Erin used this silk blend to make this beautiful Venice. And you can see that she has concentrated the heavier portion of the color towards the bottom of the shirt and the cuffs and the collar and the ruffle. And we're pairing that with our getaway jeans in a wonderful toast color. But it takes a silk into a more everyday wearable garment. That fabric is quite interesting to look at on the roll. So when you're finding something on a website that is like this, you have to think about how much you're ordering so that you can know that you have enough of a particular border color or concentration of color uh, to have enough of that to work with. So think about the yardage when you're ordering that, maybe order a little bit more than you normally would. The shirt also looks really great in a solid color. This is the viscous linen. And now you can see the concentration of the buttons. Uh, they're in twos for three sections and then single buttons above and below that. I think that's really interesting. So it does look great in a solid color. But I want to show you a really fun variation. So if you don't want the long sleeves for summer and you like sleeveless garments, then think about just deleting the sleeves and using some bias binding to finish the arms eye and the neckline. So obviously the center front placket and buttons are eliminated. The collar and stand is eliminated. Sleeves are gone. This does have a little yoke in the back and has a quick keyhole opening so that you can get it over your head. And the uh, ruffles start a little bit further away from the center front uh, than normal. But I love the contrast of these two colors. So this is a very interesting fabric, actually, for just a, what appears to be a simple cotton fabric. This is Egyptian cotton. And Egyptian cotton is the best cotton in the world. Uh, it's made with rare, long staple yarns that have been hand harvested to remove all the imperfections. So the fabric is very smooth. It has a little bit of a sheen. I wouldn't call it shiny but there is a sheen to it that makes it even more beautiful. And we have six colors of this, all of which are on sale right now, so you might want to check that out on our website. I'm going to show you the colors so that you can see what combinations you can come up with. Of course, we have the combination that I just showed you. The two the deep color and the fuchsia. And notice that this has a really great selvage. It has a woven selvage that actually says Egyptian cotton, so that you'll always know that really fine fabrics have beautiful selvages like this that can be used or incorporated even as trim on the inside of the garment or even the outside of the garment. Pardon the noise as I throw these on the floor. We have two other colors. this beautiful mustard and this great cherry red. And I think this would be a great combination as well. In fact, this mustard, even if it's, this is not a color that you really like to wear next to your face, would make a great ruffle on any of the other colors as well. So think about combining these or just make the shirt in all the same color. And of course we have white. Nothing better than a pure white shirt in Egyptian cotton. It feels so great. It's so comfortable to wear. I think you'll really like it. There we go. Oh, I have help now. Wonderful. All right. 
Um, so, um, just remember this as a variation. We, I hope to write a blog about this at some point, but it hasn't happened yet, but we're working on it. All right, um, let me talk about some other fabrics that I think might be uh, really fun to use. Uh, we have some new fabrics that have just come in that I think are fantastic. These are cottons, and look at this wonderful graphic print like this. This is something that you wouldn't have to worry about matching or thinking too much about in the cutting out process. But this is a great, nice shirt weight cotton, printed cotton. This is Erin's favorite. She picked this out. So this is a boil weight cotton, but beautiful print all over floral. This is something you might consider wanting to match down the center front, but it would make a gorgeous ruffled garment for sure. This one has this sort of watermark. Um, you can tell this just came in, it's still tied up. Just came in yesterday, actually. But imagine this in a shirt with some white jeans, crisp white pants, and denim, dark denim, whatever. But love that. Nice drape, good shirting weight, very soft feel. All of these fabrics will be listed on the website in the video section underneath the uh, actual video. Hope this doesn't tip over. Tipped over yesterday. And then this, which may be upside down, it is coming off the bolt, but you'll get the idea. Um, this is uh, this sort of uh, arabesque pattern, very, very traditional pattern with birds and sort of castle-like uh, spires on it. Um, I, I think it looks like a stained glass window. I think this is totally gorgeous. And again, a beautiful weight of cotton. have shown this before but I still like this and we still have some of it but it had a sort of architectural look to it with buildings just outlines of skylines and buildings again a nice drapey cotton these are not stiff cottons these are not like quilting cottons that have a different character these are shirtings really fine shirtings that worked well for our garments This is a rayon crinkle. I know you can't see the crinkle. I don't know if I'm upside down on this as well. It's possible. Um, but at any rate, this has a, a crinkle. I say it's rayon, and maybe I should actually look here. It might be, it feels like something else now that I see this. No, nope, it's viscose, so that means rayon. So that means it has super drape, super saturation of color, and the crinkle makes it easy to sew, because then there's a grip to things. Another rayon I love. It's all wobbled up here. There we go. Look at this. Isn't this beautiful? Whoops. You have to see the right side of it to see the great color. This combination of uh, dots it has a real painterly look to it, really soft watercolor appearance to it, but super drape. And you know, we're all about drape around here. Drape makes things, bodies look a little thinner. Not that anybody needs to look thinner, but you never know. This is a cotton that just came in as well that may be a little bit hard for you to see, but um, I don't know. If, if you want a great white shirt, this has the, these little specks of black. They're not dots. They're like you took a little magic marker and just did little hatch marks on it. But I like the fact that you could wear this with lots of color or with simple black and white. Sometimes just black and white 
is just perfect for how you feel of the day. You're feeling, you're looking really sharp and, and snappy, but uh, you're not overdressed either. And one last one. This is actually a fabric from Lafayette 148, Lafayette, New York 148, or New York Lafayette. I think it's Lafayette, New York 148. Uh, very classic pattern from them that has these renditions of a floral motif, but done in a very loose way. But again, beautiful cotton. All right, so those are some fabrics for today. Let's talk about techniques. There's always something in sewing that uh, people don't like to do. For me, it's gathering. I've never enjoyed doing it. I'm not very good at it until I sort of figured out how to do something. And I wish I could credit whoever taught me this technique. I just can't remember, but I'm sure someone at the sewing workshop in San Francisco in those days uh, probably taught me how to do this. But this has been my salvation for gathering ever since. So let's talk about what it means. Um, I have a little drawing here. Let me get my little pointer. So I've got my ruffle uh, folded in half. And after I've done that, then I run a zigzag stitch. That's shown here in green. I run a zigzag stitch 3.5 millimeter wide by 3 millimeter long. And I, I run that over a piece of heavyweight thread, something like dual duty heavy thread, cordonet, pearl cotton, could be a couple of strands of polyester thread, but something that's not going to break is the idea. So I'm going to run this thread at a half an inch from the edge, and I'm going to zigzag over that and with that width of zigzag. Then I can anchor one end of it and begin to ruffle along that zigzag. To me, this is a more um, even ruffling process than running the two traditional, the rows of two traditional um, uh, basting stitches, which is how I learned. And those never held in place. This is fairly stable. So then when I'm applying this ruffle to the raw edge of the garment with the right sides together, now I can stitch with a regular stitch length at 5 eighths of an inch, that's this blue line. And I can just be right next to that heavier cord of thread, right next to it. And it just sort of nestles right in there. So I'm sewing at 5 eighths, I'm actually skimming the edge of the zigzag when I'm catching the uh, stitch and my ruffles are very flat. But this is the tool that I use that is my new friend. This is a stiletto. It's called the Ultimate Stiletto. It was designed by Fonz and Porter, the, the quilting gurus. Actually, mine is in red because it's fairly old. The new ones that we have on the website now are turquoise. So if you order one, don't be surprised if it comes in another color. But it ha it's sort of rubbery. It's not super sharp, but it has a nice uh, catch to it in terms of its surface. So as I'm ruffling, I'm I'm pushing the ruffles down. Obviously, I've pinned this together with you not seeing the pins. But I am, this is my leveling of the ruffles so that I can sew up to this, press some ruffles down. I can push them, even them out as I'm sewing. This is just a great tool to help me to do the ruffling. So I think you'll like this. All right, now let's talk about two other techniques that are involved in not just this shirt, uh, the Venice shirt, but in lots of shirts as well. I happen to think that collars and stands are sort of the make or break for the final look of a shirt. If you don't get that stand looking really even and curved in the same way on both sides, then it just looks like you made it and you didn't buy it. So hopefully uh, we've done a couple of things that help uh, work this out for you. First of all, we have a pattern piece that is a combination of collar and stand all in one piece. So we've eliminated the whole connection of joining the collar to the stand. But in order to um, really support the stand portion, 
First of all, I interface the entire collars, both sides, both upper collar and under collar. And I use an interfacing that we sell. It's the only interfacing that we have. It's the only one we use. And we just love it. It's from Japan. It's very sheer and just a bit of glue on it. But it's just the right support without being too stiff. So we really recommend that you get some of this, you know, buy one, two, three, four, five yards, whatever, in uh, off-white, white, or black. And then um, through just the stand area, I apply a second layer of interfacing. And that's when I use an interfacing that's called a weft insertion. A weft insertion interfacing is a trico, meaning knit, interfacing with a thread that runs through it and gives it stability. You probably can't see that on the camera, but it's sheer, but it is stiffer, and, but not too stiff. And that is what this black portion is right here. So in this case, the first layer includes the seam allowances. So this has been interfaced to the edges with the first uh, layer of interfacing. And then the second layer for the stand is without seam allowances. So that's what this represents. Then I take my pattern piece and I use tracing paper and tracing wheel. And I actually trace from my pattern piece onto a piece of tag board or a manila file folder, the actual shape of the curve of the stand. And then on the tag board, I can cut out this shape. So then I can, when I'm sewing this, I can use either a friction pen to draw around that curve, or I can use a, a pencil chalk marker, which I really like, by Bowen, uh, a France, uh, a product made in France that I really like for a really thin line of marking. I can use that. So this is not a sewing tool, really. It's a marking tool so that I have this mark absolutely the same on both the right and the left stands. And that's my line to follow when I sew. So just remember that. It's, it's a marking tool. And I guarantee you this will really help you um, sew that perfectly um, both, at both times. And I try to do the sewing in the same direction on both stands. So I don't do one here and the other one here. I try to come the same direction on both so that my sewing also is more even and the stands will look the same. And then through this stand area, I'm going to trim that out really tight, about an eighth of an inch through this curve. Everything else gets trimmed to about three eighths or half an inch, but through the curve, it's very narrow so that this has a chance of, uh, since it's on the bias, it has a chance of opening up and being very flat and smooth. So those are your tricks on the collar and stand. Now let's talk about buttonholes. I was talking to my good friend the other day, my tennis friend in Topeka, who's sewn forever, and she was saying that she still stumbles over buttonholes. There's always that, she'll make four test buttonholes and the fifth one on her garment doesn't work. And I asked her if she was starting at the top. And she said, yes, she was. I said, well, start at the bottom of the shirt and make your first four or five or whatever it is and you're, as you're working up. So let's say you're one from the top. Your normal way to do a button is from top to bottom, and that's fine. Now, this one, because there's a lump of seam allowances right here, these two buttonholes are problematic. And if your presser foot, your buttonhole presser foot is not level, it might just hang up and not really uh, stitch smoothly. So, since I've, mar or I've sewn the other buttonholes, I now know the length, the exact length that the buttonhole is going to sew, particularly on a, an automatic buttonhole, which is what I use. So I can measure from where it's marked at the top down to the bottom, and now the bottom is my starting point for this buttonhole. And now I'm going to sew this buttonhole up instead of down. All the other ones are sewn from top to bottom. This one is sewn from bottom to top, so that my presser foot can be right on the flat part of this uh, fabric. 
same here. Normally we think of sewing a buttonhole from the outer edge in. Nope, sew it from the inner to the outer edge. And you'll be amazed at how that'll help. Um, I also loosen my stitch length just a little bit. I open that up. This depends a little bit on your brand of sewing machine. For Bernina, I think that their buttonholes are a little bit too dense. If you really look at ready-to-wear buttonholes, they're not a, a very closed up satin stitch. They're more open. And so if a buttonhole comes out, let's say at a 1.5 um, millimeter length of a zigzag, then I'm gonna open that up just uh, maybe to a two, something like that. I have to experiment. And of course, you always are making test buttonholes on exactly the conditions that that buttonhole will be in the final garment. So if this is a double fold uh, hem, you're gonna make your test buttonhole on that fabric double folded. If it's been interfaced, you wanna interface it. So duplicate the exact conditions that you have. Even make yourself a little curved edge with seam allowance and practice a few in those uh, troublesome areas. So hopefully those are, have I touched on all of that? Like this? Oh no, I haven't, Got, gotta tell you about this. Okay, the big deal. So uh, I make every buttonhole through a layer of tissue paper, sometimes two or three layers of tissue paper that's on the wrong side of the fabric. So this is next to the throat plate and underneath the fabric and you don't see it, but believe me, this will really stabilize your buttonholes and you won't get the crimping or puckering at the top and bottom of your buttonholes. So save some tissue as you cut out your tissue patterns and just keep a pile of it near your sewing table or, or ironing table, wherever, and uh, use it for your stabilizing. Um, you can use other things, but I, I really like tissue paper because it tears away easily and ultimately just disappears. You don't even know that it's there. And if you're cutting open a buttonhole, I've watched people cut open with uh, rippers, scissors, makes me cringe. So I love these uh, buttonhole cutters and the little wooden, well, this is an apple, but a block of wood. But this, uh, this looks like a chisel in that it's beveled on the edges. So you can cut right through the buttonhole and you won't cut the threads either at the ends or on either side of the, uh, the, the sides of the buttonhole. So I think that's, yes, I think that's everything. Zoom in just to make All right, sure we're going to zoom in so you can that. see the pictures of these a little bit closer. This, this can... template idea uh, I use for a lot of things. Whenever I have a shape that I want to sew that's just a little bit out of the ordinary and I can't really follow the outer edge of a seam allowance, then I'll make a template for marking or stitching around, whatever. So that those tag board uh, templates are your friend. I wrote an article years ago for Threads Magazine called um, The Unsung Tools, and it was all about making tag board templates. Um, Threads used to do a, uh, a survey of uh, articles that, how popular they were, and that article was the lowest in popularity. But I'm telling you, it's a good article. So if you have those uh, old Threads Magazines or the CD, DVD of their uh, magazines, check it out. I think it's still a good article. All right, one other thing I, I forgot to mention is on the collars and stands, um, we do have a tutorial on collars and stands, and there are two different methods in that tutorial on how to sew them. We also, if you also are a Sew Confident member of Series 2, that collars and stands tutorial is included in that year. So check that out. Sometimes you lose track of what's in those, but there is an index on our website of all of the tutorials that are included in all the so confident years. Okay. Okay, a few questions. Yeah. Um, do you use fray check before cutting the buttonhole? I never use fray check. Um, I shouldn't say never. I own it. I have it on hand. But if I use the tool, then I never have to use it because I'm not cutting into something that I don't want to cut. And I don't know I know fray check is not really very stiff, but it can be sometimes and I don't really want that. So no. Okay, why tissue paper instead of something that will wash away? You could use a wash away, that's fine. Uh, that's uh, assuming that you wash the garment. Okay, and how do you mark the buttonholes if you have, if you're using the tissue paper? 
maybe, oh, uh, well, uh, the marking of a buttonhole is something that, while I may have a tailor tack from the very beginning of the marking process when I'm cutting out, of the general idea of where a buttonhole is, I go back in uh, when the garment is done and with a chalkener and a ruler, I mark the top and the center line of a buttonhole with chalk. And so then the tissue paper is underneath, so you can't see the tissue paper. And so you're just sewing on the chalked marking, or what, however you want to mark your buttonhole. The tissue paper has nothing really to do, and it's certainly not an interference with the sewing of the buttonhole. Um, can um, a separate collar and stand pieces, can they be combined before sewing? Yes, there are. That's what's shown in our two in our collar and stand tutorial. The two methods. One method is sewing the collar to the stand and applying that whole unit onto the neck. The other method is applying the stand and then inserting the collar. I actually prefer sewing the collar to the stand all in one and then applying that to the garment. And a couple of questions about interfacing. Do you have a weft insertion interfacing? We do have a weft insertion interfacing. We don't have it on our website. So if it's something you need, you would have to email us or call us. And um, with the collar and stand, you were talking about a second interfacing, but I think you're using all the same. Which interfacings were you using exactly? For yeah, I'm using the shear interfacing, the ultra shear Japanese interfacing for the first layer that includes the seam allowances. And then I'm using the second layer at the weft insertion for just the stand area. That's the black part here and the white here. Okay. If you don't have two different kinds, even just a second layer of whatever you have in the stand area is perhaps good enough. Uh, which pattern has the combined collar and stand as one pattern piece? All right, so that would include the Venice, the Cortona, shirt. I don't know if you heard the question, which patterns have the combined collar and stand? That would be the Venice, the Cortona, the Balboa. Can you think of any others? Um, we might have one more, but I honestly can't think of it right off the bat. The, you know, we can post that. We'll look that up, but for sure those three. Um, when leaving off the collar and stand um, for the, um, that for the variation top, yes, uh, for the rounded neckline, do you alter the neckline in any way? Do you raise it, lower it? No, it was left the same. And by the way, I mentioned using bias binding, um, either self fabric or I've really gotten into, again, these are from, this is from my grade school, junior high days of sewing, but single bias binding, single. The name of it, right? Single bias binding. Yes, mm -hmm. this is a great thing to buy in the packages at your local uh, notion store, fabric store to use for your bindings. It makes it much simpler. Do you ever have horizontal buttonholes? Yes, um, I think style uh, dictates the direction of buttonholes, whether they're vertical or horizontal, um, but. Most shirts and blouses are vertical, but if you have a detail, if you have, you know, horizontal buttonholes can be on jackets, maybe it's a centralized button, maybe one feature button that might have a horizontal. I think that's a style issue, but I would think vertical for most shirts. Hey, any tips for getting a nice and even meeting of the collar stand to the garment edge? Oh, yes. Um, that's a little tricky to talk about without showing you how to make this edge neat. But I, one thing is I do just sew to this dot. I don't sew clear down. That's one thing. So then I trim this right in this area to about a quarter of an inch while this is an eighth of an inch and this is back to maybe three eighths or half an inch or whatever. So when I've sewn the stand to the garment, then I've sewn uh, to that dot, and I can open up this little seam allowance and, and uh, insert the garment in between those two seam allowances so that it'll turn. Well, I know I'm not describing that very well, 
without some visuals. Uh, but I do believe that is covered pretty well in that tutorial. And I probably could prepare a little sample in the future for that if we need to. Is that, I'll tell you what, that is, I agree, that is a really tricky part. And I find that I, even though I might be um, edge stitching or top stitching this seam, I'm still hand slip stitching the seam to the garment so that I can get into this area with my silk thread. I'm using silk thread for my slip stitching, which is just about invisible, and a tiny, tiny little slip stitches right at this end, and I can pull that in and make that look a lot better by hand than trying to make that work with just top stitching. Um, so I made a pair of pedal pushers out of stretch twill, and they were stiff. What would be a good fabric with more drape? Well, that viscous linen I've been talking about for the last couple of weeks would be great for pedal pushers and drapey. Um, you remember, twill fabrics, woven fabrics, tend to be stiff. We don't really sell twill fabrics for that very reason. So even just the cottons that I've been showing would be drapier than that. Um, and so cottons, the viscous linen, linen, um, cotton and lycra, we have the wonderful black cotton and lycra. We have it back in stock that I've talked about. That's one of my favorite fabrics, really. It has a, a smooth sateen finish to it. It's not shiny, but uh, just a little bit of a, of a nice smooth. Um, I think I'm going to get that in some more colors, too. We have black at the moment, but I'm, I'm looking at getting that in some other colors as well. Are there any alterations for those who have short necks? For short necks, alterations for short necks, well, it may require a scooping out in the, uh, the front so that the collar and stand sit a little bit lower. Uh, the stand can be cut down to be a little bit smaller, and of course, collars can be cut down, although I read in the Wall Street Journal over the weekend, which is my best style magazine, I, I love what they do in the off-duty section of the Wall Street Journal every Saturday, they were talking about collars right now are big and pointed. So, you know, the minute I say cut a collar down, you know, then I'm, and I'm out of fashion. But, uh, but I think a collar stand can be very shallow. Or forget the collar stand and just put a collar on. That might help as well. But you can definitely scoop out a neckline, and then you have to remeasure that to alter the length of the collar and stand. Um, with the Venice, um, if you have a full bust, do the shoulder darts accommodate the bust fairly well? Um, that's a good question. We haven't had this garment on enough people to know exactly whether it does that or not. Normally, we have the advantage of having our So Kansas events here, where people come and try on our garments, and we get to study them on lots of different bodies. That hasn't happened. Well, first of all, the Venice hasn't been out but a little while, and we haven't had an event since it has come out. Uh, my sense is that it would have a little bit of an additional fullness for a bust, but you still might need to do a full bust adjustment with or without a dart, as a guess. Um, I love the term pedal pushers. Do you have a pattern for that style? Uh, we actually have a pattern for the Helix pants, and we have a cropped version of those in the pattern, but they could easily be even shorter as pedal pushers. I think that's Probably my style that I would go to for pedal pushers. Uh, have you considered using a ruler for your photos um, for print fabrics? Um, have I considered using a ruler for the photos? Um, <laughs> oh, you mean the photos on our website? Yes. Oh, we we used to do that, and uh, why we've stopped doing that, I, I can't tell you. Yes, we've considered it. We should consider it. Good idea. <laughs> uh, let's see. Does anyone else have a question? Um, I don't see any other questions, unless I missed one. Okay. So. Well, thank you so much for all of your great questions. You can still continue to ask questions either on the Facebook page or email me, whatever. We're always here for you. We have, I think, really great response to people's issues and problems. And hope to see you again on Facebook Live and hope to see you in Kansas sometime. Talk later.